Right. We are just a couple minutes after the top of the hour, so let's get started, everyone. Uh, thank you again for joining us today for painting a picture of fewer raptor collisions, a special lecture with Dr. Megan Murgatroyd. We're really, really glad that you're here here today. Um, Meg is, is in town in Utah joining us, and so we're thrilled to, to have her here um, live at a lunchtime presentation, so you can ask lots of questions. So um, just know that, that we've reserved plenty of time for that. My name is Kirsten Elliott. I'm the Development and Communications Director here at Hawk Watch International. Um, and we, we, again, are just so thrilled that you've joined us. The program today is gonna last, um, the formal program is gonna last about 30 minutes. So like I said, there'll be plenty of time for you to ask your questions. So please use that Q&A feature or the chat feature. We are recording this presentation. Your video and audio will not be shown, but your name might be mentioned if you ask a question. So if that is uh, concerning for you at all, feel free to just type that into the chat so that I don't read out your name. Um, we're gonna get started now. Um, so I just want to welcome Dr. Megan Murgatroyd here uh, to Utah and to all of you from South Africa. And I also want to say a really special thanks to all of our generous supporters who make programs like this possible, especially the Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks program, which sponsors all of our programming for those of you who live in Salt Lake County. Uh, Dr. Megan Murgatroyd, if you're not familiar, is our Interim Director of International Programs, and she's going to be discussing today the work that she's done to protect Varroa's eagles from collisions with wind energy, as well as some new species that she's going to be working with in the coming year. So really excited to have Meg talk about this today and share some of the uh, real tangible conservation outcomes that your work is supporting. Meg, please take it away. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction. It's yeah, it's great to be talking from Hawk Watch for a change rather than at some weird time in the night in South Africa. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, kind of wh what we can do to reduce raptor collisions uh, with wind turbines. So just to kind of you know set set the scene and where where we're coming from and put things into context, the the world population is growing rapidly and we're we're approaching something like 8 million people in the world, and this obviously brings environmental pressures and measurable changes like ice caps melting faster than before and rapid loss of rainforest. But um, fortunately, to provide for our growing needs um, in a more sustainable way, the renewable energy industry is also growing really rapidly. And although wind only counts for a relatively small section of this little graph, so the little red red section, um, I'm going to basically be talking about some of the impacts that that has on birds. And a lot of the research which I do is in South Africa. So that's the 10th highest um, country in the world in, in terms of um, new uh, wind power capacity. So it's a growing market and we really need to urgently find solutions before uh, environmental impacts become too late. At the moment, we're Kind of faced with a sort of green green dilemma where we need more sustainable energy solutions but we also need wildlife conservation so we need to find a way for these two things to go more hand in hand than they are at the moment so the problem arises that i don't know either birds don't see the turbines or or they don't recognize them as a threat in time and they collide with them and they and they die so this is some results from carcass surveys from below operational turbines in South Africa. And from this sample, we can basically see that of all bird groups, raptors are dis disproportionately impacted. So they make up around 36% uh, of the bird collisions which occur. And as well as collision mortalities, there are, over, there are some concerns about habitat loss, breeding failure, and disturbance related to both the construction and the operation of turbines in sensitive locations. Um, but all in all, as long lived birds with sort of slow reproductive rates and often small populations, these impacts can lead to population declines. And in some cases, we're even becoming concerned about population extinctions due to this. So, that's the case for black harriers, which are rated as Africa's rarest or South Africa's rarest raptor. Um, there's around a thousand adults left, and they're, so their class is endangered. This picture is one in a nest, so they nest on the ground in endemic vegetation, 
and they're being killed at win by wind turbines at a sort of pretty unsustainable rate at the moment. Um, we know of about eight mortalities between 2016 and 2020, and that's just the ones which are found. Um, so this is some modeling which has been done to look at the probability of extinction over a 100 year period with an increasing number of adult fatalities from like zero fatalities and there seems to be a zero chance of the probability of extinction and then going up to five fatalities per year. And we've got a 70% chance of extinction within 100 years. So from this, you can see that really what seems like a very small increment in mortality can actually drive vulnerable species to extinction. And we're gonna come back around to black carriers a little bit later. Um, but what solutions um, can we implement to reduce these impacts on birds? So, firstly, we should be aiming to locate wind turbines and or wind farms, sorry, um, in places which don't pose a high risk to raptors. And as well as that, we've got the placement of individual turbines. So things happening on a macro and a micro scale. Sometimes we can curtail or, or shut down turbines when, when they pose a high risk. And there's been some research into visual and auditory deterrence to reduce bird activity close to turbines. These have come with like varying levels of success. Um, and when wind farms are developed, uh, these sort of um, solutions or mitigation should be applied in a, in a mitigation hierarchy. So that works on the principle that prevention is far better than cure. Um, so I'm gonna talk through each of these sort of like methods and obviously they should be applied from sort of like top to bottom of the list more or less and talk about some of the tools which are already available and some of the research that we've been doing to contribute in reducing uh, this conflict. Okay, so one example when you're looking at macro placement and where to place turbines are, are, is sensitivity mapping. Um, this this one, this sort of area has has a sensitivity map which has been made by BirdLife South Africa and it's been designed to sort of provide developers and planning authorities with like very easy access to information on the distribution of soaring birds, particularly considering here some major mi migratory routes. Um, and basically you can zoom into any location and get um, information on the protected areas, um, important bird areas, the kind of species which are present and in some cases, it'll even map like existing GPS tracking data. And so all of this information can inform like very general decisions made very early on in the in the planning process on, on when new developments should or shouldn't be aimed. So negative impacts, um, particularly on these migration routes, can be minimized. Um, and the US has got a, a very similar tool, which was created by the American Bird Conservancy. Here I've zoomed into Utah just because that's where I am right now and I can see as a developer in this area you can click on the polygons and they should be alerted to the Great Salt Lake um, down in the south we've got Mexican spotted owls and and right over quite a big area um, uh, a high likelihood of encountering golden eagles so this kind of information can help determine suitable locations for development but also highlight um, species of concern. So when EIAs are done, they can be surveyed like properly and specifically for for species that that we should be worried about. And then for particularly sensitive species, we're now looking at um, making these types of maps, uh, sensitivity maps, um, which are aimed directly at conserving um, threatened species. So this is a project we've been working on in South Africa, and it's brought together um, tracking data from all of the organizations there on the right. We've got about one and a half million fixes or GPS locations from about 70 vultures. And in collaboration with the Fitzpatrick Institute, which is based at the University of Cape Town, we've created a sensitivity map based on, on the data of the, those um, locations combined with the underlying topography and also combined with the known locations of colonies and roosts for these species, because they, they always go back to the same kind of areas. 
this map isn't quite available yet, but we're in the very final stages now, and, and we hope that it'll be available to the wind energy industry as a like online tool that you can log into um, before the end of this year. So we're getting we're getting really close. And then on a finer scale, once you've um, decided where a, a wind development is going to go, we can look at the placement of turbines within those developments and buffers or exclusion zones specifically around known nests and, and known roosts have often been recommended in, in avoiding development in, in areas which um, are like high, high use by the birds. And in South Africa, we've got these guidelines which were developed by BirdLife South Africa um, specifically for um, like highly at risk um, birds and and those are they they're unfortunately not legally binding but they provide recommendations um, which our Department of Environment refer to when they're granting uh, development authorizations uh, so they do get applied to most developments so for Varose Eagles we've actually got the second update of the guidelines now um, the first one said three kilometers from a nest there should be no development or no no wind turbines. But we've actually now revised that and updated it to a minimum of 3.7 kilometers and in some cases up to 5.2 kilometers. Hip vultures are super wide ranging and it's like 18 to 50 kilometers, depending on the size of the roost. So obviously that can be quite difficult in some cases for uh, wind developers to you know, find space for their development. So hopefully the, the more detailed sensitivity map will be helpful for this this species to improve conservation, but also improve um, development chances too in, in safe locations. Um, and then black harriers, um, where you've got a single bird, then we're recommending up to three kilometer buffers around the nest and also protecting of, of roosts. Uh, sorry, the smaller buffer for the single bird roost and the bigger buffer for when you've got multiple birds that come together and also for nests. Um, but obviously, the, the, these are great estimates and, and a great place to start, but birds don't move in a circular manner. So having having an exclusion, a, a circular buffer exclusion around the nest is limiting for both, for, so kind of both parties, you know, like birds will often range outside of that circular buffer, so they're not being conserved um, effectively, but also there might be parts of that circular buffer which they don't actually use. and um, and there could have been turbines developed in those areas. So for some species at, at higher risk, like the Varose eagle, which is actually present at about 60% of proposed wind farms in South Africa, so there's like a high conflict with that species, we've been looking at um, how these exclusions should be like more detailed and more refined. We've already had around uh, 20 to 30 fatalities of this species, so we know that it's it's quite an important target species. And basically I went around fitting these little GPS tags to, to birds, to adult birds. Um, Burrows eagles are comparable to your golden eagles, except for they don't migrate. So they can be found at or close to their nest the whole year round, even when they're not breeding. Um, this is some of the GPS data um, from one of the individuals. So. You, it's really unique in the, in the resolution and basically from this data, we can look at uh, relationships of their flight with the environment. So eagles are very reliant on uplift, they're, they're soaring species, and that uplift is generated by the landscape. So if you can numerically understand the relationship between the, the flight and the topography, then we can start predicting it. And so that's kind of what what I aim to do. And it wasn't just predicting where they would be flying, but but specifically where they would be flying at the risk that they're likely to collide with a turbine. And in the end, I've, we managed to create a model, which is now kind of commonly known as VERA, which stands for the Burroughs Eagle Risk Assessment. And um, this is an example of how it can be applied to a wind farm. So here in the background, the, the green shading just rec represents the topography of the area and the boundary is a, a proposed wind development. 
the red crosses are proposed um, turbine locations and the triangles are eagle nests with a three kilometer buffer starting around them. So you can see that in the planning stages, um, turbines have been put at least three kilometers um, from the nest. And then uh, using basically this information on nest distribution and topography, we can run the Vera model and we get these risk predictions. So these predictions are on a scale of zero to one, one being like high risk and zero being low risk. Um, but for this to be sort of useful um, and relevant to development, we really needed a cutoff. So you know, if I give this back to a developer in this stage, it's still going to be like, okay, but you know, where is it okay or not to put a turbine? So we created a sort of three categories of low, medium, and high risk. In low air, low risk areas, um, we like recommend that turbines can't be built. Medium risk areas kind of need a little bit more input, might need some more mitigation, or, or perhaps from the environmental surveys, you find that actually they are um, areas that eagles do or don't use commonly. So they, we kind of ask for a bit more input on the medium. And high risk areas we don't recommend are, are developed. So in this case, we can see that the turbines locations that are just turned black um, are considered risky. But because this can all be done like really early on in the planning stages, as soon as the eagle nests have been located, we have the opportunity to ask developers to move those turbines into low risk areas and kind of find a solution that can protect eagles and the development can go ahead. So this model is now available in South Africa for wind developers, and it's been applied to around 30 proposed sites. So it's been, yeah, it's been really great to see how a tool like this can can contribute a sort of practical um, conservation measure. But I often think about those birds which are less predictable. So here's the black harrier again. And uh, this little map here uh, is going to show it's a ranging behavior of one individual that I've been tracking on the West Coast. So where the little red dot started off was his home range for about nine months of the year. And he didn't leave about a mile radius of his nest, um, even while he wasn't breeding. And then all of a sudden, about two months ago, he, he headed off on this massive journey, like over a thousand kilometers across the country, only to return home again and then quit pretty quickly after that to leave again. So we've got these sort of like very much like wide ranging, um, almost semi migratory and uh, but certainly unpredictable movements. And I'm quite interested in in what what else can we do for species like this, where uh, any kind of buffer is not going to be a successful conservation measure. So. Um, there, there's a bunch of different things we can do, and one of them is is shut down on demand. Um, so you can use radars or tracking data or cameras um, to do a sort of automated uh, shutdown. So let's see if this video will go. Yeah. Um, so in this case, this is like a video just of showing how a radar system would work, and birds would fly into an area, get detected by the radar. The radar would have um, some sort of uh, um, way to classify like the size of the bird and hopefully identify the species and for any really at risk species, then the relevant turbines can just be automatically closed off and in the same way cameras can do exactly the same thing. So there's a system, for example, called identity flight flight and that is a really similar system to that radar video that just showed and. But it's set up with the cameras so that you have cameras in the middle of the wind farm that are detecting birds and then using an algorithm to say which bird it is and which camera which uh, turbine should be shut down um both of those come with like quite a high cost so that's obviously a little bit of a uh, thing for a developer to weigh in on and kind of as a result of that we certainly haven't seen that uptake of either of those methods in south africa yet um you can use tracking data if it's really specific birds that you want to protect. So, for example, the Californian condors, because it's a limited population size and, and a lot of the individuals as that population have grown have been tagged. I know there's a wind farm that have basically got a geofence around it. So every time one of those tagged condors 
fly into that wind farm, they can switch off relevant turbines also automatically. Um, in South Africa, we've, we have seen uptake of, of a similar thing of shutting turbines down, but it's observer led. So you have people who are employed to uh, sit on a hill and watch the wind farm and determine um, if species are present that are at risk. Um, that that's great, but obviously there's human error involved. So, so also not a perfect thing. And then there's something which I think has got a lot more promise is just looking at temporal and seasonal and weather related patterns of how birds are behaving and seeing if they can be used to understand flight behavior in a better way and to be able to sort of predict the conditions of when and where turbines should be shut down. So I've started using uh, tracking data to basically look at these patterns and, you know, like us birds are creatures of habits. So this is just taking that black harrier data again from that um, previous video and looking at the time of the day and the altitude the bird was flying just in those couple of months that were represented. Um, so in this, the, the collision risk zone would be from about um, 50 meters above the ground up to around 250 meters, depending on the size of the turbine. But obviously you want to capture that area that um, the, the blades are turning to so the rotor swept area. And we can see that like that black area is mostly at risk between 10 a.m. And, and 6 p.m. And sure, just if you're just going to use time, then that's still quite a wide window. But if we can combine that with um, other variables to really narrow down when risk occurs, then we can start thinking about how we can use that to shut turbines down. So for seasonal things, I haven't used the data yet to look into seasons because this is obviously quite a new project. But what I do know for Black Harriers is um, the, the collisions which have been recorded, the mortalities that have been recorded, they all happen during the breeding season and mostly specifically during the chick rearing season. So that's talking about a month long window. So from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. just for a month of the year could be getting closer to a suitable mitigation. But there are other variables we can still add on top of that. So weather conditions, things like wind speed, temperature, maybe pre precipitation um, will also have a big influence on how birds are flying. And things like fog and, and sandstorms will reduce visibility. So, I mean, that might not directly affect bird flight, but it will certainly affect how well they can see the turbines. So one last example here of the same tracking data again, and uh, this time that there's the collision risk sort of altitude, and this is the temperature. So um, from about 15 degrees C up to about 35 degrees C. So uh, on very cold days and very warm days, uh, birds are, this bird is less likely to be at collision risk too. So if we can really, you know, narrow down all of these variables, I think we can come up with uh, quite specific thresholds when risky turbines in risky locations um, can be shut down um, and, and can be shut down automatically um, once conditions reach these thresholds. So. That's something particularly for black harriers, which I'm going to spend uh, the next year or so trying to uh, get more information on. And so the, lastly, there have been uh, some tests on sort of visual and auditory deterrence, trying to keep uh, birds away from turbines. So using lights is a is a real common question. They like can't can't we light the turbines up better and Certainly in, in low conditions, lighting might help to increase uh, visibility of turbines in low light. Um, there have been a few tests to explore this, and one test found that uh, if you shine UV light up the turbine um, during low light conditions, then you can get a 27% decrease in bird activity around it. And the same for, for just violet lights. Um, it was a bit of a lower decrease in bird activity, 17% decrease, and and that's great, but it's not really going to be affected for effective for like very strictly diurnal species like the eagles and the harriers. So there's also been tests on on how noise can be used to deter birds. Um, there's been exper an experiment um, using white noise and and sort of 
blasting that, but it was experimented on a communication tower, not a wind turbine. So they found that doing the short blasts of white noise um, did reduce bird activity by 17%. And I know other people have looked at using blasts like more similar to a gunshot, which might be more scary for a bird. And some people have explored how mobbing behavior, uh, mo mobbing sounds like the sort of sounds crows would make while, while they go and mob large eagles, um, how that might um, change behavior and deter eagles. Um, but I think, you know, the, the main problem with all of these methods is that, um, Eagles hearing is isn't great. It's not it's not as good as ours even. And it's thought that eagles can probably hear a, hear the noise of a turbine at half of the distance that we can. And that noise of the turbine is also going to sort of interfere, particularly with things like white noise. So, um, yeah, the effect on us is probably going to be poor from that point of view. And then there's also the risk or the likelihood that that eagles will habituate to any of those noise. And over time um the these would become sort of less effective so yeah i'm not I'm, I'm happy if people can share other methods with me but i'm currently like not aware of any sort of robust and long-term studies on on the use of really lights or noise to reduce uh bird activity around turbines um one promising thing that people have been spending some time on lately is blade painting so when a turbine spins there's a motion smear so that's basically because those blades are are white they they almost become invisible particularly when they're spinning at a really high speed so how can we increase the visibility of those blades so that eagles avoid them a little bit more and um, i'm really interested in how this can be used because it's really commonly being advocated as a as a mitigation method for environmental management plans in south africa but it, I, I think that in reality, we still don't know enough about its effectiveness, but this was an experiment uh, which was undertaken in Norway. So there, there was a big wind farm called Smola and they monitored bird collisions for three and a half years. Then they, th this photograph is, is from one of the turbines that they painted. So they painted one, one blade back. Um, and they did that on, on just three turbines. So it is a relatively um, small scale experiment at first, but it was long term. They went on and they carried on monitoring for collisions underneath these turbines for another seven and a half years. And basically their main finding was that annual bird fatalities decreased by 70%. But it's it is a small study and it's in one site so they did conclude that you know the the study should be replicated and we need to be able to determine the the generalizability um to to other species and to other landscapes so it's it's a promising initial result but i think to be a commonly adopted mitigation method we we need to know more so this is an operational wind farm, which I've been working at. The white dots at the bottom are, are the turbines and the tracks here are, uh, are a Vero's Eagle, which I'm currently tracking. And every time those tracks go orange or red, it's obviously getting quite close to a turbine. And the plan is that there's actually three pairs of eagles which nest in close proximity to the, this um, site. And I'm gonna aim to track at least one individual from each um, pair and measure their movement both like before and after blade painting happens. And then we'll also have like some turbines painted and some turbines not painted. So we'll have a, a sort of treatment and control um, system as well. And then using this sort of like detailed look at their behavior rather than just measuring the mortalities that occur, um, I'd, yeah, I'd like to be able to measure it if the, paint, the painting of those blades increases eagle avoidance of those turbines and if it does work then i do think it could be uh, an effective and and a relatively cheap mitigation method if it's um adopted when when turbines or before turbines are are installed so yeah that that's an exciting project which is still ongoing at the moment so just to um finish off this is the trajectory of wind power in or wind power development in South Africa. Down at the bottom end, 
um, our first wind farm became operational in 2014. And by the end of 2020, um, so the blue is the, is the number of wet megawatts which are being produced. Um, but yeah, by, two, by 2020, that was 32 wind farms. And in 2022, or the 21, so last year and ongoing into this year, an, an additional 33 are under construction. And this will all basically contribute to the target of 11 gigawatts of installed capacity by 2030. So it's going to be a, a huge growth in the industry. And to put that into perspective of the potential impact on reactors, um, in 2015 and 2016, there were two fatalities of black carriers each year. In 2017 alone, we had seven Cape Vulture mortalities. Um, in 2019 alone, uh, nine Varroa's eagles were killed. So, yeah, these are just little, those are just some examples and some snapshots of the impacts. But what we can certainly expect is that, you know, as industry grows, the conflict will grow. And if we don't have like robust conservation measures in place. So, I think there is potential for good mitigation and it can be effective, but it's often species or, or even location specific. And moving forward, we need to be exploring and, and implementing these methods in accordance with that mitigation hierarchy that we started off with to ensure that conservation and sustainable energy development can happen and, and we can come to some sort of, um, we can solve this green, green dilemma and, and have both. So yeah, that, that's what I wanted to share with you. Thanks for, for listening. And um, I'm sure we've got time for some questions. We do, and we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, before we jump into questions though, I, I wanted to say, Meg, we had someone who pointed out at the very beginning that you're backlit a bit. So I was wondering if you wanted to maybe turn your camera off for a minute and adjust your lighting. Um, and I'll um, share a little bit of an exciting moment here while Meg does that. Um, so, uh, Meg has spoken with you all today about her, her tracking work and, um, you know, you may be wondering with all of this, you know, um, with the tracking work, how, how she's collecting this data, how this is working. And so, uh, we mentioned the transmitters earlier and, um, as you might expect these tiny devices that you can place on a Raptor's back and, um, you can use to track them for, uh, many, many years in such rich detail. Those are not, um, super inexpensive. And so we really do rely on, you know, grant funders, corporate funders, as well as individuals like you all. Um, so we began offering transmitter sponsorships a few years ago, but it was quite a costly um, purchase. It was a one-time gift. So we've moved to a monthly model to make it a lot more affordable. Um, so I'm going to put the link in the chat right now. If you want to take a look, we only have a few Raptors available right now. So I will say if it's something you're interested in, definitely jump on it um, because we need Meg to get back in the field to put out more transmitters before more are available. Um, but so it's a monthly gift and then you get quarterly tracking reports from, from Meg. And so uh, you get to track your bird, you get to name your bird, you get a wonderful welcome packet. So if that's something that's of interest to you in supporting this work, I hope you'll check it out. Okay, Meg looks much better much more nicely lit now. So we'll hop into okay. these questions. <laughs> it happens, you know, you're in a different place. Um, we had some really fabulous questions. So um, one of the first ones that uh, we got and I really enjoyed was from Peter and he was mentioning, you know, really this green, green dilemma, right, Meg? Um, the place, the very places that are so impactful for wind farms are also the places where raptors want to be. So, uh, you know, he asked, are the wind developers just supposed to settle for less optimal wind wind farm settings? Um, so what is that trade off, I guess? Can you speak to that? Yeah, no, he's totally right. And I must say, so I can't see any of the questions. I can't find the chat box anyway, but that's great if you can like transmit them this way. Um, and yeah, no, he's he's right because there is, there is a trade off because um, yeah, they, they're seeking the same resources and Eagle is using the exact same resources to fly as a wind turbine is using to turn. Um, so there is a trade off, um, but I do think, I mean, Speaking specifically for South Africa, which is a big, big country, we have so much potential wind that um, I think that there's still space for enough wind farms to generate that sort of energy that we need without it having to impact as badly as it is 
at the moment on on reactors. I mean, if we can also apply these additional methods like blade painting when they are more risky and things like that, I do think we can come to sort of yeah, like some some sort of trade off that that's appropriate for both halves. But it does, yeah, it certainly does require flexibility on the developer's side as well to to want to make a change and and occasionally take a take a site that is not their their primary choice, but is still adequate to provide energy. Yeah, and I'll just tack on to what Meg said. Um, I think that that's, that's such a focus of ours at, at Hawkwatch International and has been since our, you know, our incorporation is that we really do want to find this productive middle ground where we can make sure that we have the things that we need to not just survive, but thrive as humans, but so do raptors. And um, I think we have a long history of working with industry here. I'm really, really proud to see that, uh, that Meg's work has been able to continue that tradition. Um, Talking about some of the the mitigation tactics, Meg, um, one of our, our guests asked about, you know, the cost effectiveness in terms of these tactics. So they're asking, what's the cost of blade painting? And is that more cost effective than other solutions like Identiflight or, or something else? Yeah, so I think um, so yeah, Identiflight, the, the cameras and the radars are expensive systems. Um, I don't know the exact cost, but that's certainly why I think they haven't been uptake uptaken in in uh, in South Africa. Um, and then things like the blade painting is actually quite cheap, so that I think that's also why I'm so often already seeing it like advocated in in environmental management plans, which is like you know like the plan set out once once construction has happened and if there are environmental mon um, issues then people are saying or developers are saying well then we'll we'll paint the turbines no problem and i'm like oh that that's that's great but we don't know if it's effective yet um but that's being you know advocated so often because it is cheap and and that's even talking about you know like doing it post construction so that it actually involves people abseiling off the hub of the wind turbine to go and paint the the blade while it's while it's installed, which is expensive and and risky for the guy who has to go and do it. Um, but if we if we talk about like you know Im implementing that at the pre construction phase when you're just painting it in a factory, it becomes even cheaper. So if we can prove that it's working and it can be implemented in the factory, then I think that would be quite a, a very cost effective method. Well, to uh, uh, what I'm going to assume would be a much less cost effective method, but is interesting. We had a question in the chat about, um, so um, could you have signals that could be used to shut down on demand with instrumented birds? I um, mean, they were specifically thinking about like um, condors in the United States and how they're all instrumented. And so could that work? Um, and maybe this is a good time to just chat about, you know, putting transmitters out period and, you know, the work that goes in for you, Meg, but also, um, you know, some of the pros and cons for Raptors as well. Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, like, d definitely, like, um, GPS tags can have these things like, geo they're called geofences, but essentially it's exactly that. It's an area that you've predetermined in the landscape that you either want an extra alert when it goes into that geofence, or you want it to increase the tracking resolution when it goes in there. Um, so that can be and is being applied to wind farms. So the Californian condors are, are, are a perfect example. Most of the population is, has already got GPS tags on it. Um, and that is being used to shut down um, wind turbines nearby, which is great. But when I think about like Burroughs eagles in South Africa, they're so widespread, you know, like they're, they're at 60% of developments. They, they live in like a really similar environment and there's no way that I can or anyone can track all of the affected birds, basically. So I think for, for these more widespread species, it's not effective from that point of view. And there's always like a cost benefit that I think of when I personally deploy a tag. I'm like, no, it is you're, you're catching a bird, you're handling the bird. There's going, there's going to be some impacts on the bird and it's now got to wear this little tag. I mean, they, they are really small and we don't. We don't suspect that there's any um, impacts of that tag on the bird, but it is all things that you know you're, you're interfering with wildlife. So you have to like consider these things carefully. 
And I think that go for me, it's not going to be a solution to go around and just tag all of the various eagles and, and just shut down turbines. So I think it's only in like very specific cases like the condors where it can be like really um, a successful mitigation. I had another question about um, rose eagles specifically, and since we're speaking about them, maybe let's go there next and, and types of behavior. And just as a, a reminder for those of you who haven't put a question in the chat, if you're not familiar with rose eagles or black harriers and just want to ask questions about the species, Meg would be happy to answer those as, as well. So don't feel like you have to restrict them simply to the, the wind energy component. Um, but this is about uh, rose eagles and their nest usage. So do they reuse their nests every season? And if they don't, then how do you account for that in the model? Yeah, no, they, so fortunately they do. They're like, they're, they're very territorial. And, um, you know, some of these nest structures we've got on record for being, having been used for like 50 years plus. Um, so it'll be like a, and sometimes they can have multiple nests, but when they do that, they're generally on the same cliff face. So that I've seen up to five and one extreme occasion, there was seven various eagles nests, but they're all on the same cliff face. So you can still use the same central points. And then if they have more than one nest at the beginning of the season, you'll see they start like refurbishing one of them. And that's the one that they're, they're going to breed on, but they're, they're so close in proximity that the model can just use both of them um, and, and it's fine. And it's great that they always come back to the same nest. We appreciate them making some component of this research and conservation a little bit easier for us, Meg. Um, that carriers are not quite so um, uh, <laughs> uh, easy going like that. And they'll, they'll actually build, choose new locations. So that's also another problem with, with model. They're normally, nearby, maybe within a kilometer or so, but it is an additional level to having to figure that species out. Yeah, and and also I presume that just makes getting the tags out that much more difficult too, because it's always a, a bit of a scavenger hunt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a, another question on mitigation strategies um, is how, how big of an issue is it for a wind farm to shut down a turbine? Um, and I'm gonna read the pun because I'm a sucker for them. Um, do the companies squawk much? about this <laughs> very good i like that um yeah so it it changes it depends actually so i read i can't i think it was for the californian condors they calculated that they were shutting down the turbines for less than one percent of the time so it and it was like making like minor um impact or or almost no in, impact on the energy generation so, but I think that can vary from species to species. And if um, in the case of like the various eagle tracking data that I showed where it's like quite, that bird is quite frequently flying like over the plateau where the turbines are, those turbines would being would have to be shut down like quite uh, quite frequently on a daily basis if, if that's the, if that's gonna be the solution. And I mean, in this case, because the bird is being tracked now, it, it could potentially be the solution in the future. Um, it's not at the moment, but yeah, so I guess it depends like how, how close is the bird maybe nesting to, to the turbines and how risky are those turbines in the, in the first place to, to determine how often. And I, I think that would be like very site specific and species specific of how often it becomes, but I, had recent conversations with one developer who has identified an area um, of good wind um, capacity and really wants to put a wind farm there. And they've actually calculated that if they don't uh, run the wind turbines at all during the day and only generate energy at night, that they would still make enough energy to make the project worthwhile. So they're considering that as a mitigation because there are eagles in the area. And it's, I mean, it's very early stages at the moment, but it is something that we're discussing. So that goes from one end of the scale of having them off during the whole daylight hours and it's still being worthwhile in, in good conditions. So yeah, I think it's difficult to put an exact answer on that one, but there's a rolling scale of it. This is this is tricky stuff. Um, each site eats each species. We're lucky to have someone like Meg on staff who has such deep experience in, in this specific area. Um, another question um, that uh, was asked, but I, I want to ask a question previous to that is, I mean, I think most of us here on this call love birds, or that's probably why you're here. 
Um, but can you just speak a little bit more, Meg, to like why this this truly matters in the first place? Like, why do we care about the birds that are, are you know at risk here? Not just for the sake of the birds, but what's the the impact potentially to the larger environment and to us? Um, and and what happens if they go away? Yeah, cool. I think you know, like birds are a uh, you know it's one of those species we can look to as an indicator, and if we lose any bird species, I suppose, actually, if we if we lose a species, or even in some cases, if we gain a species, or, or the increase in abundance, not gain a species, but, you know, those, any change in, in bird abundance is really a sign that something has changed in the environment, and generally losses of bird species is a sign that something has changed for the worse in the environment. So I think they're, they're a really good sign of, like, um, the health of the environment from that point of view. But they also like for raptors, they they're contributing to 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 the health of the environment directly themselves as well by you know like controlling prey prey species. Um, often here, you know, like some some farmers will complain about um, burrows eagles, for example, because of conflicts with with lambs. But then it's good to always remind them. But hey, they you know like their main part of their diet is, is the dassy or the rock hyrax. Which, if you didn't have something predating that, then you wouldn't have any grazing areas because the dassies would eat all all of the grass. So it's, I guess like it's just important to keep everything in balance in terms of environmental health, and and the raptors are a great indicator of whether or not those things are in balance. Well, this this set me up, I think, pretty well then. So then, in terms of our our health of our environment, and specifically with you know South Africa and what you're seeing, Meg. So the question was, what confidence do we have in these bird loss numbers? Um, because this person's experience in the San Francisco area um, has suggested that predators might be grabbing the carcasses of birds before they could be collected, and so losses are being undercounted. So. What's your take on that in South Africa? Do you think that the the numbers are pretty spot on, or do you think that the situation might actually be far worse than what we're seeing? Yeah, I think unfortunately that um, that question is spot on because I think it is like you know the numbers that we're usually presented with are are minimum numbers. So that that uh, slide right back at the beginning showing the percentage of each um, bird group that were found under turbines that is literally the ones that were found. So. There is like predator removal, um, and then there's also just like a observer like ability to find things for the smaller birds more so. But like you know, it it's quite a task to like just search the area below a whole wind turbine. It's it's a big area, especially when you're talking about a whole wind farm. So we we miss finding some of them. So we we miss some. Um, our, our gaps are sometimes too long between between checking and and birds decompose or are eaten by scavengers. And we also don't, most of these studies don't check all of the wind far of the, the, the turbines. So we're then like sort of extrapolating numbers up to other turbines, which might be like in more risky locations in the wind farm. So there are estimates, there's, there's usually ways to account. So they, they do things like um, scavenger um, carcass removal trials where they put out like known carcasses and and leave it there either with a camera or simply like go back to it every day for a week and figure how how long it took for that carcass to rem to be removed or to disappear. Generally, I think with big birds like eagles and vultures, even if they are eaten, there's there's big signs of of feathers and things and you can still identify the location if you find it of most large birds and for smaller birds then yeah carcass removal is a big problem. And they, so they, they sort of make these indexes to scale up the numbers that are found, but then it's really becoming an estimate. So the solid numbers that we're looking at when we're told this many eagles have been killed at this wind farm are definitely minimum numbers. That is um, not a good thing, especially for our black carrier feathered friends who are, are already in such small numbers out in the wild. Um, we are almost out of time, but we are also almost out of questions. So um, if you have any last questions, feel free to put those in the chat. We still have a little bit of time. Um, I There was a question asked a little bit earlier, and I think you covered it, but I just want to make sure that I ask it in, in case the individual missed it. Um, so, with regards to types of wind turbines, Meg, um, so in terms of risk, are the, they were asking if the, the large ones that appear to rotate more slowly, are they less hazardous than the smaller ones that appear to rotate more quickly? 
Yeah, good, good question. And I've certainly seen some research like beginning on that. I don't know if there's any clear answer, but what is definitely true is that the large ones produce more energy. So we need less of them. If you if your aim is to produce a certain number of megawatts on a wind farm, and you can do that with five big ones instead of 10 small ones, then I think that inherently the risk is lower for birds. Um, so yeah, if we scaling up energy is probably a good thing. Um, whether or not those individual turbines do present more of a collision risk, I don't know if it's known yet. Um, and then I think of a, a thing of the future, which is worth mentioning, but not implemented yet. yet. I'm sure a lot of people have seen like things like there's developments of um, uh, poles which shake and generate power instead with the wind or or things which turn on a vertical axis rather than these sort of like um, more horizontal planes. So um, I think or I hope uh, that in the future, maybe maybe we'll have more bird safe de designs, but at, at least in the next 10, 20 years, we're going to see more of the traditional wind farms and, and we need to tackle that anyway. One last question that came in, um, and uh, so a little bit uh, less relevant, perhaps, for some of us who are just big raptor nerds, but thinking about all sorts of birds. So are the, do we have the same sorts of concerns and problems for offshore wind farms, Meg? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, we definitely do. And so they'll be dangerous for things like seabirds and like <laughs> talk going back to like finding, finding carcasses underneath them and saying that, you know, it's, that's really difficult when it's land based, or you can only imagine how difficult it is quantifying that when it's sea based. I know that um, offshore wind farms need to do environmental impacts in the same way that we do on on land, and they will have to go out and do like surveys from boats to observe um, seabirds, sea mammals and all sorts of things that are, are impacted by those turbines, but how they measure the impact afterwards. I'm I'm not actually sure, but I can just imagine the challenge. I think that's a great place to to land as we're wrapping up, Meg. I mean, this work is is really difficult. Um, and you have worked on Froze Eagles for many, many years in really challenging situations. Um, you know, how what do you need to be successful in this? You know, if you had a magic wand how would you how would you use any extra funding if anyone's sitting here feeling really inspired and thinking you know i want to help mag conserve these these raptors in south africa or or elsewhere because we'd like to you know expand this research as well yeah cool um so i guess i mean like the success of most of our works and then i i have to mention that most of the work i've done as well is like through collaborations i've not done any of this single handedly um uh, the cape vulture map being a great example that was done with um most well a lot of organizations contributing data and we had a postdoc at the university of cape town patchy cervantes who developed it um so you know like having funds and resources that we can grow, continue to like grow our team and collaborate with people and and keep people involved because we need multiple minds uh doing this um i always need resources for more tags but then again like you know like once we've got that data we need enough uh, uh people using that data and coming up with these mitigation methods so yeah anything that can help us to grow our collaborations and grow our resources in the field is an amazing help and to keep asking the interesting questions to keep us thinking about uh you know new new things we can try Absolutely. Well, I, I think that's such a good reminder that, um, you know, everyone has something they can do to conserve raptors in our shared environment, whether it's contributing your time, your talent, your, you know, your treasures, whatever it might be. We need each and every one of you. So um, with that, I think we'll close out and thank you for for taking the time to be part of this, to learn about this. I mean, as you learn about this, you become great advocates for raptors and you help us share this message of ways that we can we can actually move the needle forward on raptor conservation. So thanks again for joining us, Meg. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day, everyone. Let us know if you have any questions.